from the headquarters of Telesur English in Quito, Ecuador. I am Estefania Bravo and this is From the South. Thousands of Guatemalans have again protested against President Jimmy Morales and in defense of the International Commission Against Impunity. The demonstration in the center of Guatemala City was led by students and joined by campesinos, workers and a number of social movements. They want the president to step down after he suspended the work of a UN anti-graft commission and banned its head from the country. Now, what we are witnessing is a situation that could possibly be a coup, and what happens is that the country's democracy, constitutional guarantees and human rights are in danger. And it's not just about Jimmy Morales, it's about that block of impunity around both the executive power and the Congress, which with their actions are seeking to guarantee impunity. Earlier, Guatemala's Constitutional Court repeated that the head of the United Nations anti-graft mission can enter the country. It called on the president to lift his ban on Ivan Velasquez. The UN mission is investigating a number of corruption cases in the country, including one against the president. Our correspondent Mario Rosales was with the protesters in Guatemala City. We are still here at Constitution Square in Guatemala City, where demonstrators continue to arrive. They are demanding the resignation of President Jimmy Morales. Among the protesters are a group of students, campesinos, and social movements. They want the ruling of the Constitutional Court to be respected regarding Ivan Velasquez's return to the country. The resolution was ratified by the General Secretary of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres. The question here in Guatemala is still what will be the position of President Jimmy Morales, whether his government will obey the order of the Constitutional Court or not, and if they are going to respect Antonio Guterres' decision to keep CICIG director Ivan Velasquez as head of the Commission Against Impunity or not. We thank Mario Rosales for that report. Students in Mexico have been protesting over the disappearance of 43 students four years ago. The protesters threw Molotov cocktails at the army headquarters in Iguala, where the students from Ayotzinapa were last seen. The government says they were killed and incinerated by a drug gang. But the families and supporters of the students have repeatedly rejected that version. They suspect the army was involved. Renowned U.S. linguist and activist Noam Chomsky has said, quote, it's Lula's right to be the next president of Brazil. Chomsky made the remark after visiting the former Brazilian president in prison in Curitiba. He said the meeting with Lula was very exciting. Mm-hmm. The campaign is heating up ahead of the presidential, legislative and regional elections on October 7th. Our correspondent in Rio de Janeiro, André Vieira, has the latest. With just over two weeks to go until the general elections here in Brazil on the 7th of October, the candidates are stepping up their campaigns. Fernando Haddad, the presidential candidate of the Workers' Party, or PT, the candidate backed by Lula da Silva, is campaigning hard in Sao Paulo, Brazil's most populous state, with the largest concentration of votes. Haddad has the big challenge of letting people know that he is Lula's candidate and of getting them to transfer to him the voting intentions that Lula had before and which made him the favorite to win. Haddad is standing alongside Manuela Davila of the Communist Party of Brazil as his running mate for vice president. Recent polls show Haddad consolidating his second place. On Wednesday, the pollster Datafolha published a poll which gave Haddad 16% of the vote, behind the far-right candidate Jair Bolsonaro with 28%. But Bolsonaro is also the candidate who has the highest rejection rate of voters who say they will never vote for him. For example, a poll by Ibope showed that 55% of women in Brazil would never vote for Bolsonaro. 
On the 29th of this month, a big rally is planned against Bolsonaro with the name Women Against Bolsonaro to reject his sexist and homophobic views. We're also expecting protests in other parts of the world against Bolsonaro, calling for Brazil not to follow this path of the neo-fascist right. We thank André for that report. Monica Benicio, the widow of murder council woman Mariel Franco, has condemned the Brazilian government at the UN. Benicio spoke with representatives from the UN's Human Rights Council in Geneva, Switzerland on Wednesday. She condemned the indifference shown by the state towards the murder in March of this year. Six months later, justice has yet to be served. The first female president of the Congress of South African Trade Unions has emphasized the rights of women at the workplace. She was speaking at the closing ceremony of the 40th Congress in Johannesburg. Women within the ranks of this radical trade union movement are ready to take the responsibility at the sharpest end of the struggles of emancipation of all women in our society. While caring ourselves, comrades, to occupy the front ranks and call face as the organized and class consciousness detachment of the broader working class women. Venezuelan migrants continue to sign up for the government's return to the homeland plan. This Thursday, another group is coming back from Colombia. Our correspondent in Bogotá, Paula Fernández, has the details. The Venezuelans returning home made the final arrangements at the embassy in Bogotá. In the afternoon, about 76 people are finishing the registration process. They will then travel in two buses to Bukaramanga, where they will join two buses, and then all travel on to Cucuta, where they will cross the border into Venezuela. There, they will receive medical care, as happened with the last group, and meet up with their families. And earlier this week, a second flight arrived from Peru with 90 Venezuelan migrants as part of the government's return plan. One of them was Freddy Chirinos. He lived six months in Peru and says it was the most difficult time of his life. Here's his story. A rainy morning in the state of Miranda where Freddy Chirinos was reunited with his family after spending six months in Peru. He shared the experience with Telesur. For him, it was the beginning of a new era. We are almost at your house. How do you feel? I'm really happy, very anxious to see my family, my wife. It has been six months since I've been abroad. It's time to see his family at last. He told us his six months in Peru had been the most difficult in his life. I had some offers from friends who said, come, everything is okay here. So I went. I even sold my car so I could go. When I arrived there, the reality was different. The first shock I had was the problem of age. There you have to be less than 30 to get a job. Exploitation at work was part of his experience in Peru. I got a job that started at 8 a.m. and I used to finish at 10 or 11 p.m. at the earliest. They exploited Venezuelans because they paid me $9 while they paid the Peruvians $15. We started at 8 a.m. and we didn't have a fixed time to leave while they started at 10 a.m. and finished at 6 p.m. So there was abuse against Venezuelans. The unfair campaign by the media against migrants resulted in discrimination against Venezuelans. The Peruvian media is full of xenophobia against Venezuelans. I watched the news and they were talking about a thief, and they say he must have been Venezuelan, when they didn't know. It's not like he was robbing, showing his ID. There's a media war against Venezuelans in Peru. They say they treat us well, but it's not like that. They see women as sex objects, and they see men just as cheap labor. He says there is a lot of false information about the return to the homeland plan, which aims to undermine this initiative by the Venezuelan government. There have been a lot of rumors saying that they have paid us, that we came to the airport, that they took away our passports. But it's not true. I have my passport. I have everything. They have treated us very well. We are amazed by the attention given to us. The bad days have passed for Freddy. Now he's preparing to begin a new life in his own country, which he says he should never have left. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us.
Welcome back. The Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi has arrived to the Dominican Republic to open the Chinese Embassy there. Our correspondent Daisy Toussaint reports from Santo Domingo. This will be the first visit of the top Chinese official to the Dominican Republic after the two countries established diplomatic ties last May. Wang will meet with his Dominican counterpart, Miguel Vargas Maldonado, and will attend the inauguration of the first Chinese embassy in Santo Domingo this Friday. Recently, the Chinese ambassador to the country, Zhang Ran, considered expanding the maritime Silk Road to the Dominican Republic. This could also bring increased infrastructure development, such as electricity, roads and ports to the country. The ambassador also highlighted that the construction of such a route could add a new dimension of cooperation between China, Latin America and the Caribbean. The Chinese ambassador added the relation between China and the Dominican Republic are entering an exciting new phase. The visit will end with a meeting between Wang Yi and the President of Dominican Republic, Danilo Medina, in the National Palace. They are expected to hold talks with local businessmen about the possibility of additional investment between China and Dominican Republic. We thank Daisy for her report. Grenada and China have signed a multi-million dollar memorandum of understanding. It's all part of China's Belt and Road Initiative. The MOU will allow Grenada to benefit from China's technological expertise to improve infrastructure. Grenada is the sixth Caribbean country to sign on the MOU. <laughs> The 40 billion euros. A day after Barbados Central Bank announced details of its debt restructuring, opposition media have been claiming the government is bankrupt. The reprofiling could mean people will lose money as they will get less returns on their investments in form of government bonds. But the government has said earlier there was no alternative to tackle the country's massive debt burden. Earlier, my colleague Soyuni Gray spoke to economist Jeremy Stephen. He disagrees that Barbados is broke, but acknowledges the situation is dire. Uh, sorry, sorry, so as a result of being able to keep up with those pension payments, the government really had to ensure that the NIS was affected. So unfortunately, everybody in the country, even if you are an individual holder of government debt, or if you are an institution, or if you're not, have been affected uh, by these decisions, uh, even if Pensioners in Argentina have been protesting outside Congress against the government's economic policies. The demonstrators are marking Pensioners Day by demanding that lawmakers declare an emergency. They say the cuts agreed between President Mauricio Macri and the International Monetary Fund are making their lives impossible. Our correspondent in Buenos Aires, Edgardo Esteban, has the latest. The pensioners have been holding an important demonstration, both to celebrate their day and to reflect on the very difficult situation here. With this economic crisis that's hitting the entire population very hard, pensioners are among the worst affected because of the benefits they have lost. As a result of the pension reform approved by the government majority in Congress last December that took away $5 million, Supposedly, it was to go to the provincial governments, but they got rid of free medicines and other social and health benefits. At the same time, the increase in pensions is not enough to keep up with inflation. Even though that's supposed to be guaranteed by law, President Mauricio Macri is not respecting it. So it's a complicated situation which people are confronting here in the front of Congress on a day that was meant to be a celebration, but it's now one reflection on the struggle ahead to achieve a decent old age in Argentina. That was Edgardo Esteban from Buenos Aires, Argentina. Just hours before Mexico's earthquake memorial, security forces violently evicted residents of a central neighborhood in Mexico City. 100 police officers in Rayaquil were deployed to evict people squatting outside a building damaged by last year's earthquake. Dozens of civilians were left injured after violent clashes broke out. The victims say they were supposed to enter the building to reclaim their possessions, but were surprised by the arrival of the police. Most of those affected belong to the indigenous Otomi community. They didn't have an eviction order. They just arrived and started attacking everyone. They hit a number of women, they even hit children. That is beyond unjust. We are here because we don't have the resources to go anywhere else. 
The debate over the construction of Mexico City's new airport continues. Business groups are pushing for the project, while social organizations oppose the possible devastation it would cause. The construction of a new highway connecting the New Mexico City International Airport with the tourist town of Teotihuacan is endangering hundreds of families. It's not only their homes that are in danger, but also the lands where they grow their crops. This development model pushed by the government is not content with the land given to the airport itself. There always needs to be more land, more natural resources taken. They are pushing us out of our lands, where we have lived for many years. At various public forums, representatives from affected communities and social organizations have presented their arguments to reject the massive project, which is also plagued by irregularities. Residents say it benefits a small group of business owners. Carlos Slim continues to win contracts to build the airport, while at the same time, he himself is financing it through Imbursa, one of his financial companies which has provided a loan of over $3 billion to the project as part of the private investment package. Activists say it's hard to compete against big business, businesses which start massive projects without thinking of the communities affected, and they do this with government approval. The Mexican business elite has had a decades-long, perverse relationship with the government. Often, you cannot tell who's a public official and who's an employee of these companies. Therefore, these businesses depend on political decisions. The business council overseeing the project has recommended that incoming president Andrés Manuel López Obrador finish the construction of the airport. The government could lose $6 billion by stopping it. We also suggest they consider the risk of damaging the reputation of our country to get national and international investment. Over the past few years, we have raised about 150 billion pesos in investments funds for the airport. For its part, the incoming government has floated the option of building a new terminal at an Air Force base that would operate in conjunction with the current airport. The decision will be made based on the various studies being made by all those involved, but will also involve a referendum on October 28th so the people may voice their opinion. Peruvian authorities have recovered more than 1,700 artifacts stolen from the country. The retrieved reliques include countless pieces from lost civilizations from the pre-Hispanic times. As a result of international investigations, the artifacts were brought back from countries like Australia, the United Kingdom and Holland. Peru has recovered more than 7,000 stolen artifacts in the last eight years. In El Salvador, cyclists are charging the future of urban mobility. One nonprofit organization called BC Red believes the rise in commuter cycling demands the urgent restructuring of urban planning and thinking. It's an incentive to get pedaling. Cycling is a healthy form of exercise, an efficient means of transportation, and it doesn't harm the environment. It's no wonder bicycles are reclaiming their space on the crowded streets of South America. Members of Byside are pioneering a two-wheel revolution. That's why they're urging government to move full speed ahead with the passage of legislation to ensure cyclist safety. What is the advantage of using the bike from the health point of view, from the nature, environment point of view? It does not contribute to the climate change. Also is good from the economic and the traffic view, because where a car parks, 20 bicycles fit. Parliamentarians were invited to get pedaling in the streets of El Salvador, but cycling safety can be a two-way street. The city is usually crammed with cars letting out exhaust fumes, and the reality is there are dangers facing cyclists on city roads. There are a lot of car accidents. Car drivers don't respect motorcycles or bicycles, and the risk is higher for them. I think we should work in this proposal to promote the use of the bike as a way to help the environment. But we also have to establish terms that assure the respect of the cyclist. Meanwhile, lawmakers are giving urban cyclists the assurance that they're not about to backpedal on legislation to protect them on sometimes hostile streets. 
dentro de pocos días vamos a tener la aprobación. In a few days, we are going to have the approval because virtually it was fully discussed. And the proposals of this law are not only benefits for the cyclists, but also to the environment protection. Sino también de proteger el medio ambiente a través del uso de la bicicleta. During Cyclist Week, the public invited to take part in a range of activities, including rides with other Salvadorian bicycle groups. They're not reinventing the wheel, but they're hoping to change the face of urban commuting. We'll be back very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back, and now it's time to bring you some other stories from around the world. Report says Boko Haram militants in Nigeria have killed nine people and injured nine others during raids on villages in the state of Borno. The area has been under ongoing attacks in the last nine years of insurgency that has led to more than 27,000 deaths. Formerly known as Swaziland, the monarchy of Eswatini is heading to the polls on Friday to elect 59 constituency seats. After the election results, the king will appoint the prime minister and the cabinet. Two African organizations have deployed election observers. Other international organizations like the EU is not sending any delegates as they don't consider the current political system democratic. Our voter turnout was very good. We do not have continuous voter registration. We uh, registered over um, about 530,000 uh, uh, voters, and that is above um, half the population of this country and about 90% of the um, eligible voter, uh, voters in the country. Thousands of people from the Africa Europe Interact initiative have demonstrated against the additional fortification of EU frontiers during the EU summit in Salzburg in Austria. Migration is the main agenda of discussion during the summit. The 28 EU leaders want to further curb the influx of immigration by raising the number of border guards to 10,000. The Muslim Shia community in Lebanon marked the Ashura festival by taking part in a self-flagellation ritual. During a public procession, men beat their chests and cut themselves with knives and swords. Ashura is a day of mourning for the martyrdom of Imam Hussein Im Ali, the grandson of the Prophet Muhammad. The act of self-flagellation and beating oneself is symbolic of the grieving process. And before we go, we leave you with these live images from Sao Paulo, where Brazil's presidential debate is taking place. It's the first with the Workers' Party candidate Fernando Haddad. The far-right candidate Jair Bolsonaro is, of course, not taking part. He is still in hospital after being stabbed. Com resposta em dois minutos. A réplica terá um minuto e meio e a tréplica um minuto. Não haverá repetição. And with those live images, we've come to the end of this news brief. These and other stories, as always, find them on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. And also join us on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. For Telesur English, I am Estefania Bravo. Thank you for watching.